welcome you to this month's webinar. Um, Waypoint serves churches and leaders around the Mid-Atlantic region, primarily in the states of Virginia and North Carolina, <coughs> though also in Maryland, a little bit in Upper East Tennessee, and even now down in South Carolina just a little bit. About 520 churches that we try and serve in a number of ways, but particularly with strategic services for leaders to move their church forward. Uh, but one thing that we started three years ago was this webinar series to try and interface with leaders, as, um, as many lay leaders as, as professional clergy, for lack of a better term, to help equip them and resource them to be the best leaders they can be for the church. And so uh, we have a variety of topics um, that we cover uh, from month to month uh, in rotation, a little bit of a rotation about first impressions and assimilation uh, for mission committees, prayer teams, safety and security teams. But our best attended is often the ones with uh, elders and trying to equip elders because there's just so few resources out there to have elders have a healthy perspective on how to best lead their church in concert with, in partnership with their staff. And so that's kind of the topic that we have here tonight in specific is how the elders and the, the minister at a church work together to come to a resolution on a new way that they can move forward as a church and their leadership. So we're, we're glad for that, and we're going to introduce them in a second. Well, first of all, I want to thank Mid-Atlantic Christian University, to be who is our ministry partner in the region, uh, but also has been our sponsor of our webinar platform since the very beginning, three years ago. And now we do have a webinar um, YouTube channel. If you were to search on Waypoint 55, all one word, uh, you would find three years worth of monthly webinars and more resources uh, that might equip you in one of those areas that I've described. And so uh, so that we hope that you might do that. You can subscribe to our webinar channel so that you get not notified whenever a new, um, a new webinar gets posted to it to see if you'd like to go uh, either view it or forward it to someone at your church that could benefit from the information that we would present there. So, um, so we're thankful for Mid-Atlantic Christian University that's been our partner since day one for that. We do an annual report to Mid-Atlantic Christian University, our partner, to let them know uh, how many people, and uh, it's been pretty remarkable, the increase in our viewership over the last three months with some of the special webinars that we've put together to help churches lead through this unprecedented time. I hate to use the word unprecedented because it's precedented that we now use unprecedented all the time. And so uh, so uh, I don't like to use that word, but we are uh, Waypoint. Uh, one of our taglines is that one of our roles is to do ministry, to, to navigate ministry together. Oh, the word waypoint is a navigational term. It's the markers along a journey to make sure you're headed in the right direction. And uh, we feel like we, we come alongside churches and leaders through all the reroutes of ministry to get them their church and themselves headed in the right direction together. And so, boy, in the last three months, uh, we've needed to uh, really go through uncharted waters on how to lead the church through a time such as this. So, um, so we are glad that we get to help with that tonight. So I'm going to end this poll right here. Thanks for chiming in on that. And I want to, uh, I want to have our guys uh, go ahead and introduce themselves, uh, uh, just uh, generally who they are and and uh, their story to get us to the screen today. And then we're going to dive into the very specific topic about this conversation about the minister and his office hours and the way that elders and the overseers of the church kind of view that and what the what the opportunities are there if they were to look at it from different angles. So guys, go ahead and take take turns to introducing yourselves just generally that gets us here today. Thank you, Lord. Well, I'll start us off and my name is Terry Wheeler and uh, I'm pretty much a lifelong resident of Roanoke Rapids and I have been a part of this. I was born into this church and, and I have been with the exception of, uh, you know, five years of college and a, a year living in Newport News, I've been, you know, a regular attender of this church for, you know, 50 some years. And so um, I'm, I'm representing the eldership as far as the, uh, the leadership is concerned. So that's, that's where my comments will be coming from as we walked along this journey with Jason. But I've been associated with all three ministers that we've had over our, over a 67 year period of time. Oh, wow. All right. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. I did forget to say, 
uh, for all those that are on the webinar tonight. If you have a question along the way, the best way to handle that is not to hit the chat button, but to hit the Q&A button and to go ahead and type your question as you think of it rather than waiting to the end and you might forget it. Uh, and it gets put in a queue over here on the side of our computer so that we can see the questions that we can try and answer either kind of in the flow of the conversation or at the end of the conversation. Or if we don't get to answer it live, uh, we get a report after the fact of all the questions that go in the Q&A queue. And so we can answer those after the fact over the next day or so. There will also be some slides here that, that we're gonna have in part of our presentation. And there is an automated email that gets generated uh, tomorrow that you will receive. And in that, I'm gonna include Jason's email if you have questions for him, but also a PDF of tonight's slides. And there's some other resources that you'll see in there, links uh, in there for some of the resources. So uh, Cliff Manuel just chimed in. Cliff, uh, glad that you're uh, with us tonight as well. And um, so, um, so if, as soon as you think of a, of a question, go ahead and uh, chime in on that. And, uh, and then we will try and answer that um, live or after the fact um, within the next day or so. So go ahead, Jason. Sorry for the interruption. That's all right, that's all right. So um, I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia and went to Johnson uh, University, Johnson Bible College at the time. Uh, at, while I was there, I started working as the part-time youth minister at a little church right near Johnson's campus, uh, Gap Creek Christian Church, and ultimately was youth minister there for nine years. Took some time off because I did my seminary work at Emanuel School of Religion. I know that name's different now. And then did doctoral work at the University of Tennessee. So that's when I took a time off from official vocational ministry. But then I um, did not finish my dissertation at UT, uh, went up to Indian Creek Christian Church up to the creek and worked uh, on the executive team up there for four years, uh, leading the adult ministry at the creek for four years, and then went and worked at a, a fast growing church planning church in the Raleigh area for two years. Uh, and then for multiple reasons, wanted to make a shift and landed here uh, in a smaller town, smaller church, and so I've been here at East 10th Street for uh, about six, well, it was April, so April 1st of last year. So we're probably within that uh, 15th month now, I think. Uh, so, you know, not yet a year and a half. Um, but so that's kind of a context of, you know, some of my journey from really small church to mega church to fast growing church planting, you know, multiplication church back to a smaller uh, smaller church, but now also a smaller town. All right. And so for those of you not familiar with the geography, Roanoke Rapids is northeast North Carolina, almost to uh, almost to Virginia. How far south of the border are you? 30, 30, 40 miles? About 15 miles. 15 miles, yeah, not too far across there. So, um, well, the, the topic for tonight is about the minister and his office hours, and I can relate to this very clearly, um, not so much personally, but I remember a conversation that I had with the youth minister of the church, first church that I worked at full time as a pastor, and um, within the first couple of days that I got into, the, into that church, he and I had a conversation about the expectations that the elders had on him. It's different as a youth minister, but there's some similar uh, theme in this as he was out Friday nights and, and Tuesday nights and doing stuff on the weekends. Uh, but he uh, the he got a lot of grief for not being in the office at 8.30 every morning. And we were expected to be in the office at 8.30 in the morning, um, unless you had a note from your doctor, basically. And, and he'd be out till, you know, all hours of the night doing stuff with kids. But if he showed up at 8.45, he got browbeat by the secretarial staff and others. And that's, we're not talking about youth ministers, but it, we are talking about the, the expectations, some of it sometimes written, often it's unwritten expectations, but just about office hours, just for office hours versus office hours for what they accomplish. And so uh, Jason, if you kind of just set up the conversation that drove us to where we are today uh, of what happened there, and then I've got some slides that you want me to go through um, that, um, or that you're going to go through that I'm going to that I'm going to advance for you that kind of explain the thought process as you guys work through it together as a team. 
That's right. And that's, that's, a, that's really what this was, you know, when we were asked, hey, would you do this? It was to share our journey, not like, hey, could you go research this and give us best practices? It's, this is the journey we took. And so it's what we share, you know, tonight uh, from, you know, my perspective and then from the eldership perspective. So when I, when I was interviewing for the position here, uh, I was very conscious, you know, that this was a different move. Tess and I, my wife, we, we wanted to make a move to a smaller church, a more traditional church, uh, and even a smaller town, and if we were going to stay in ministry. And so one of the things that they said, uh, the eldership said to me, or really the search committee said to me was, you know, we want you to be able to preach, but we also want you to be good with people. Like we want you to actually care for people. We want you to visit people. We want you to make calls to people. Um, we don't. We don't want you to think that this is just a preaching gig. And so that really was impressed upon me. Uh, and that really fits my own wiring. Um, I like to read. I like to study. Uh, I have a large academic side, but at, at the end of the day, I, I need to be with people. I like to be with people, and I'm energized by people. And so that's kind of been the journey we've been taking for the last, you know, up until about January of, of this year. And so this conversation, the journey I'm about to share, this is pre-COVID. Um, and so I think something, and Tim, you can help us to remember this, or Terry, so someone can remember, or, in the, or you know, the people watching. Um, if you don't hear this, then ask. Uh, this story actually took an interesting turn during the 10-week shutdown. And so we're actually moving into a different phase once again. Like I just emailed the elders about this topic today because of how this story continues to shift as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, so this is all pre-COVID-19. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm out and about, I'm meeting a lot of people in the community. I'm meeting a lot of people in our church. And I don't know if it was January, early February, one of our elders came to me and said, hey, I want to talk to you about your presence in the building, you know, being here during office hours. Now, at that time, we had a secretary. She since retired, um, and she had told us before we ever hit COVID-19, she was retiring after 17 years, um, that he was just concerned that I about me being in the office. He thought the understanding was that I would be in the office more consistently. And so he was just concerned and wanted to at least have a conversation among the elders about this. Uh, one thing I really appreciate about this elder is this elder is direct. Like, I don't have to wonder, oh gosh, you know, am I going to get, am I going to get a, a, you know, sword in my back? Uh, and he even told me, he said, hey, I'm going to be bringing this up to the other elders so that we can have a conversation. I don't want you to think that I'm saying anything behind your back or I'm saying anything different than I'm going to ask them about. And so that really opened up this conversation that we had, I thought we had already had, or at least we had talked about, but you know, it's different to talk about it in an interview before you're ever on the ground. It's another mm -hmm. thing to get 10 months into a, you know, ministry in a location and then to come back to that same conversation. And that's what we did. It was like, okay, well, let's be really explicit about what expectations are. And, and that, so that's what we did. Um, and it was really fruitful. And so this is, I think, Tim, where we can jump into the slides, because what I want to do is just take you through the journey uh, that I began to take and then how that fleshed out with the elders. Um, so one, the first thing I did was I thought, you know, let me see what, what's being written about this. At least let me see what best practices are. So I literally just Googled something like pastors and office hours, something, something generic, but it was specific to grab, you know, grab the topic. And th these were part of the top like 10 articles and they, you know, catch your attention. So nine issues regarding pastors and office hours by Tom Rayner, seven reasons to consider not requiring office hours for ministerial staff. And that's, you know, coming off of a Lifeway, uh, a, a significant website, um, part of Lifeway's ministry. Pastor's office hours, time to cut back from Ministry Matters website, and then six reasons why pastors don't need an office anymore. You know, a little more provocative there at a Christianity Today blog, uh, a guy who works a lot with smaller churches. And so I just read these articles like, okay, let's just see, let's see where the pulse is on this topic. And, you know, I didn't agree with everything. It didn't all fit me but I tried to pull away some highlights. And so let's go to that next slide. Um, 
uh, we'll just we'll just run through the whole this we yeah. So these were the highlights, and I shared this with the elders. So we sat down a, a couple of weeks after this one elder came to me and talked with me, and I said, okay, and I shared with them. These are the articles I read. I'm trying to get a broader perspective. Maybe I'm the one. Yeah, maybe I'm off. And so the highlights were that all of these articles in some way touch these four things, that we live in a mobile world. And today, even more than just 10 years ago, people are more accessible. Interesting, the, one of the articles used the example of the plumber. So, you know, 10 years ago, the plumber puts a sign out, you know, rent space, puts a sign out, hires a secretary and waits for business, you know, people call, call that, that place of business. And then you go out and you do your work. Well, with the mobile phone, you can just call your plumber. Interesting, we have an electrician uh, that, as one of our elders, and he piped in at this point and he said, I, I let go of my secretary. Like, I got rid of my rent in space. And he held up his mobile phone and he said, this is my office now. Uh, and, and this elder is, he knows how to use technology, but I would not call this elder tech savvy. I mean, he, he knows what he needs to do to get his business done, but he's not, you know, a savant working on his iPhone all the time. And so he really resonated with this, that even he, you know, right on the edge of 70, if he is understanding how accessible people now are, um, that, that really resonated. So another thing that was the highlight was that fewer, fewer drop-ins. So initial contact is usually through digital technology today. If someone's going to contact the church, they usually don't come to the front door. They, they'll contact through email, uh, Facebook Messenger, or maybe Instagram, depending on how your social media presence, what your social me media presence is like. And I'm just, these resonated because this is the experience, even at a smaller church in a smaller town, I, the people that show up at the church front door in my time here, in those 10 months before, you know, we had this conversation, were people asking for food or assistance. Um, mm -hmm but you had your initial contacts were either on a Sunday morning or they were reaching the church some other way. Um, another highlight, the third one here was most churches are trying to get their ministers out. So it's odd to have conversations about how to keep ministers in the building more. And a key phrase that resonated with me and it resonated with our elders was, and I didn't, this is from one of the articles, we create ministry, we don't wait for it to happen. And so it really, that really resonated because, um, I know that it, even in my friends or my peers and just hearing stories along the way over the years, if there, there sometimes is a challenge to get the minister out into the community or among the people. So the fact that we're having a conversation about how to, how, what it looks like to stay in, it may, that may be a reversal of the direction you're trying to go. And then a lack of creativity. Uh, the office usually is not a place for creativity. Um, and I just know for me personally, that really resonated because I do some of my best work and I've done it throughout my academic life is I like to write and research at home. I just resonate. I mean, just that's where I work best. Um, and it's less distractions usually too, unless my kids are there. Uh, important context. Can't believe I didn't mention this. I have a 14 year old boy, a 12 year old boy, a four year old girl and a uh, almost 18 month old boy. So four kids from 14 to 18 months and my wife works full time. So just that's context too. I, it's not like I'm walking around with a bunch of time on my hands. Uh, but you still like to write your sermons at home. But, but when they're not home, and we'll come okay. to, yeah, when they're not home, yeah. Right. COVID-19 was not generous in that way. Okay, yeah. um, all right, let's go to that next one. So I shared those highlights. Now I'm gonna, we're just gonna bring Dave Heilman in and, and I hope I don't, uh, you know, disparage his, his wis you know, his wisdom or his intelligence here. I, I hope I've represented him well. I, I called Dave and I, you know, Dave, you Waypoint Church Partners has so many relationships that have blessed, I know for me and East 10th and so many other churches. I just said, Dave, what are you seeing out there? What are you seeing at newer churches, older churches? Just give me your sense about office hours. And I just, I, I wrote him down. And so he said, you know, new church plants rarely have an office. Several churches don't have an office by choice. Um, some churches have choose to have limited office hours. Um, often the trend seems to be uh, 
you know, anecdotally, that office hours increasingly are used as a time to do staff meetings. Uh, that was the way that it was at the church I came from, uh, the fast growing church planning church um, was office hours were fundamentally the moment where you could get all the staff together. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing he said was the most effective use of a pastor's time today beyond sermon preparation is making contacts outside the building. So again, I'm, I was trying to gather what, what are the trends, what are the best practices? So I shared this with the elders um, and some of this really resonated with them. I then decided to also bring to that meeting, what did I do over 10 months? Like, I mean, I can feel a certain way all I want, but what, like literally, what did I do in 10 months? So let's go to that next one, uh, the next slide. Um, so I just wanna show you, this is, this is like, I didn't even realize this until I, you know, pulled it, you know, and I, I keep everything on my calendar, keep a lot of details of what I do. Um, I had from April 2017 when I arrived at East 10th to February uh, 2020, I had 65 total meetings with members, attendees, or visitors. And that includes going to a lunch, a coffee. It also includes long phone calls. Uh, this is where my AirPods come in real handy because I can just walk and have a long conversation. And it does include office visits. I determined when I looked at all those that 14 of those 65 were office meetings. Uh, so 25, 21.5% of all of them were in my office. Five of the 14 office meetings were spontaneous. So that just means of all the total meetings I had, only 7.6% of all my meetings were spontaneous in my office. And that just really struck me because if I'm sitting around in my office waiting to, for people to come in and have meetings and be available, that may not be the best use. Like 7.6% is not that's, that's not the best, maybe the best use of my time for, to be available. Um, and then I just tracked, what about my visitations? Like literally when I go to someone's house, hospital, or nursing home, and I had 76 of those. So I had a total of 141 total meetings or visitations. And of those 141, 14 were spontaneous. I'm sorry, five of the 141 were spontaneous meetings in my office. Um, and a meeting is something that goes longer than like 20 minutes. I mean, it's something that it has some substance to it, not just a come by and chat. All right, so let's go. So just, I was like, okay, well, let's just see what else I was doing. Um, so this is the work I was doing outside of regular business hours. And it's important. So like, if I'm thinking eight to five, what was I doing outside of the eight to five? Because that's something that's really important. And you kind of spoke to it with the youth minister who, you know, they're doing stuff on Tuesday night or Saturday night, stuff like that. So you got all these pastoral calls, text messages, and social media interactions, and those often do not fit in the eight to five uh, time range, you know, time frame. I had funerals, uh, four specifically. I had one, I had other weddings, but those were some from the other church that I, you know, they wanted me to do their weddings, but one from East 10th. Um, I attended special church events, uh, attended and participated in youth events. Uh, participated in different groups like men's fellowship and there were several committee meetings related to budget and things getting ready for the new year at the end of 2019 and then I played on the church softball team. None of those things were happening inside of the regular business hours. Uh, so just give some just further context. So go to the next one. Um, another thing that I, I was I really wanted to make sure to do was be connected and you know wanted to be get into the community. So just here's some things that I'm, I'm also doing. Uh, now these are often inside of business hours, but they're not in the building. So involved with local chamber of commerce, um, I'm on that board of our local chamber of commerce. I serve as the chaplain of the city's fire department. Interesting enough, part of the work I was already doing in the community is what drew them where, how they, how I, I came onto their radar because uh, they did not have a chaplain at the time. Um, and I think they have 30 some fire fighter, like 30 some staff. So it's a, it's a decent size for a small town. I serve on the board of the city's housing authority. Um, we do a monthly Bible study to local retirement housing facility. Obviously that's been put on hold with the COVID-19. Um, participate in community events and the church's fellowship hall. So our fellowship hall actually is um, used by several community organizations. Even our school system uses it, for example, for their end of the year teacher appreciation dinner. Like I did the prayer for that, for example, last year. So I, I go to those things and get to meet a lot of people in the community 
um, and then represent the church. I met with local political and business leaders and I planned and built, uh, built the community partnerships uh, for, we did a generosity feeds event where we picked 10,000, packed 10,000 meals at a local elementary school. And those went to our local school district. And that was, um, you know, there were over, I think there were about 230 volunteers that came to that out of the community. But there was a lot of things that happened in the community to make that happen. All right, so go, let's go to this next one. Um, so then I just wanna just show the impact of all that work that was being done outside of business hours and outside the building. So our average attendance of the first three Sundays of January of, of 2019 was 94. I was not here at that time. And they were, they were searching for a minister at that time as well. So they're without a, a steady minister. Um, the average attendance for the first three Sundays of this year was 135. So it was a 44% increase in just a year. Now, when you get those small numbers, it's easy to get higher percentages, but still that was a, you know, 44% increase was significant. And, you know, I don't take all the credit for this, but I do think that being out in the community, building relationships and different channels in the city were an important part of our church being known, seen, and building, you know, friendships that made a difference in people ultimately coming. And, and there are, there are people that are coming that, that weren't going to church. And that's, that's been exciting to see. And those are relationships that had, that were built through a lot of this community involvement. So let me, the last two slides I want to share, I want to be almost read them verbatim so that I'm clear and I don't, I don't uh, wax on forever. Um, so here's my point of view. And this is what I ended this meeting with the elders with, um, was here are the things that I've been doing. Here's the, I, here's at least an impact we're seeing. Here's the best practices. So here's where I come that I view my presence at the church office as functional. So I'm there because I need to be. So the reasons I might be there include, I might meet with people. So that could be staff members, attenders, visitors, community contacts. I mean, all those reasons you can use the office. Um, some admin work like printing and making copies. It's a quiet place to work if the kids are at home and it, and convenient. So sometimes it's more effective than going home to just come to the office and work for a couple hours. Uh, that often can just be more convenient. So I come to the office with a purpose because honestly, I have limited time. And with four kids and a working spouse, like a full-time working spouse, time is limited. So I want to use it every moment I have effectively. And that doesn't just mean between eight and five. Um, so this is kind of how I view the office. If you, if, if there's not a reason to be there, <laughs> then I don't need to be there. I can, I will make, I will make something else happen uh, that's effective. So last slide uh, is kind of my summary. And, and again, in this meeting, I wasn't just reading this verbatim. I had made notes and we were talking about this, but for this for this purpose of a webinar, I just want to make sure this is clear. Um, I think we're moving into further into a post-Christian world, which means we can no longer assume that people will come to the church. Uh, ministers are increasingly more like missionaries who go out rather than professors and bank tellers who sit and receive. Uh, so, if, and, and this is where my struggle has been. Maybe some people on the webinar feel this too. If I have any major struggle, it's that I feel like if I'm not at the office, someone's going to judge me because that's still such a stigma. Um, so it's been something I struggled with, which is why this meeting with the elders was so important. It really helped clear the air. Like, here are the expectations, and we're okay with this. Like, oh, breathe easier. Um, my most important work happens primarily away from the building during the week, meeting with people, building relationships. Uh, nearly everything else I do can be done off-site with, uh, you know, mobile technology. So cell phone calls, sermon prep, text messages, admin work, social media, all that. And often I'll do that. Sometimes I'll do it at five in the morning. I'm not a late, I don't work late, um, but man, I've worked on stuff early in the morning. Um, and honestly, flexibility allows me to be more effective. It also allows me to care for my family, which has been a real big blessing, you know, with our family. And it allows me to actually just do more ministry. So that, that was all part of the conversation we had back in February with the elders. And it allowed us to clear the air. It allowed for flexibility. Um, and I'm going to stop there. That's all my part, Tim, because uh, at this point, I think it's important now to hear where the elders and how, you know, particularly how Terry, because he's got the, a long perspective. Uh, of, mm -hmm. of the church. So Terry, you just take it away. Well, let me let me interrupt. We've had a couple people hit, uh, 
uh, the Q&A button. So if you got questions about what Jason just presented or follow on questions about, yeah, but what about this or what about that? Go ahead and hit your Q&A button and they'll come up in our queue and we'll try and answer those here at the end or, or afterwards. Uh, so uh, thanks for chiming in for the couple that we've got already. Uh, but there's just a couple things I'll, I'll, re I'll respond to as we're transitioning to Terry. Okay. One thing is uh, you'll a couple of healthy things. One is the if you can see the depth and the healthiness of this kind of conversation, but not argument among the elders. Uh, and so that that they talked about here's the dynamics. Let's work on this together. And so that's that's a position you've got to get in. Flip side of that, I'd say is one thing that made it healthy is that um, is that uh, Jason kept records of what of what he did. And it's not to build a case, you know, to prove his point, but to build perspective on how he builds his week and his days. And there's a difference. If you're keeping track of your time, uh, but there's a lot of guys that, that don't do that. Of course, I appreciate it because apparently Jason and I are fairly similarly wired in that. As I keep track of phone call, it's going to be more than 15 minutes. It's in my, if it's a scheduled phone call, it's in my note, it's in my date, you know, my date book and, and every meeting that I have. And so I can go back over uh, a month or a quarter or a year and keep track of that so that I can see how can I be most effective with the limited amount of time that I've got to serve. And so I think that's really healthy for some guys it might be a real challenge and say, oh, it's not my personality uh, to do it. But I think we all could probably improve to some degree of where you're at on keeping track of how you uh, work your schedule so that you know, here's how I could get better. Here's what I could do more of. Here's what I could do less of. And so I think that's really positive uh, modeling that we're getting from Jason there is just keeping track of how he organizes his week. Uh, but I do resonate with that whole fact. Of course, I was a, I'm a two-time church planter. So I never early on had elders looking over my shoulder. I didn't have elders, you know, to begin with. So I didn't have any and, you know, church planters don't have offices necessarily. We got them eventually, but, but, uh, but I've been in, in, that, uh, in that world where you've got to make ministry happen. I really resonate the fact that we're American missionaries in this generation. Uh, you can't just put a sign out by the street, say we're open for business and people are just going to come to your church. Uh, and that's not what you do when you go overseas. You have to go out and be with the people. And that's where we are in this postmodern world. So I really resonate with that. It reminded me of, uh, for some people on this webinar tonight, might know uh, Charles Fisher, who was on our board of directors. He was a pastor in many places, but um, he was the president of our board recently, he passed away just uh, not too long ago. But he was at the Tr Peaks View Christian Church in Bedford, Virginia. And uh, boy, he, I don't know if there's a, a civic servant better known in his community than him. And he built his church based on the relationships he made in town. And so, uh, so I just really appreciate that perspective, whether it's in a church plant or an established church, that you can go out and be known in town as that's, a, that's the pastor right there. And whether they, even if they don't go to your church, they know you're a pastor. And, um, and I could think of other examples that we have in our region of guys that uh, kind of have that feel in their community. So uh, that's some, that's some great stuff. And then, so, um, so let's get the flip side of that conversation uh, from Terry's perspective on how this conversation went and how you guys negotiated and navigated through this conversation. Well, um, I, I kind of think that as far as the elders are concerned, of course, when you think of an elder, you think about a bunch of old guys and that's exactly what we are. <laughs> but, but we've been around for a while. And, and most of our, most, well, all of our elders have been members of our church for, you know, a decade or better. And, um, and we've been through three ministers that are completely different as far as, as, you know, their, their method of operation, if you will. We, we, you know, we had one that was like half and half, you know, in the office, out in the field. And we had one that was like, a majority of them in the office and a whole lot less in the field. And then we have one now that would rather be in the field and not in the office. And, and I think what the elders have to do is that they have to kind of fit, you know, the minister to his, let him have his, let him work with his strengths and fit it 
to the congregation. So we, you know, cause we know how the congregation is. And of course we hear it, you know, if, if they don't like something, you know, and so mm -hmm. with that kind of, you know, so you can see how we had, you know, three completely different personalities, you know, over these years, you know, and so when Jason came to us, we had, we, you know, you just have these assumptions. This is the way we've been doing things, but then you've got a completely different person here who's got completely different characteristics and he can't, you know, and, and we were kind of looking for him to fit the mold that we had before. And that just didn't play to his strengths. And we just didn't think that way to start off with. We were looking at, you know, this is the way it works. And, and that was hamstringing him. And now we didn't know that, but until we started having this conversation and cause you know, you can't learn a whole lot about a person from an interview and this kind of thing, you know, I mean, we knew he was a wild man, but other than that, you know, you, there's a lot you learn along the way. And, and he's so much better with people than being hamstrung in the office. And so, you know, when, when we got together and we had this conversation, by this time, we all had a feel for his strengths, you know, and we knew what the congregation needed. And so, it was it was our job to kind of try to fit everybody together to where the puzzle fit together you know and so his his ideas that he had you know we knew him now and we knew that's exactly his personality and and nothing nothing beats success you know and so we've been seeing extremely positive results from what he was doing but he was feeling bad about it because he was doing something and we might've been looking for something a little bit different, you know, but you know, there's nothing like success. And so we felt like, you know, after having this conversation that, you know, we, we, we need to let him do what he's good at instead of try to make him do something that we may want him to do, but that makes him less effective as far as a minister is concerned. You know, and so that's kind of the way when, when he explained, you know, this, this is well, what he just presented to you. When he explained that to the elders, I mean, we were just unanimous and that's fine. You know, that, that is fine, you know, and, and, and it's been working until we got in this COVID disaster. You know, everything was working, working great. And oddly enough, as he mentioned before, you know, in the past two, two and a half months, he's almost, he's had to revert to the, the 90 in and the 10 out, you know, because of, of the dynamics we have, you know, but he's built such a, a repertoire of, and such a rapport, I should say, with the congregation that we've been able to stay together, you know, even though we haven't been able to meet until recently, you know, and even that's truncated, but, you know, and I think all that's because of we let him do what he does best. And I think as elders of any church, anywhere, you know, they've got to take, they've got to think about, you know, what, what's, what is our minister, what does he want to do? And what does he prove that he's really good at? And you got to kind of let him go at it, you know, and, and uh, it may not be what you thought he should have be, but it's, it, it works. You know, and so I think sometimes elders need to take their, foot, their feet off the brakes, you know, and, and try to put him in a box and say, you know, well, let's see, you know, and, and he realized, he said, if this doesn't work, you know, then, then we'll, go, we'll go another way, you know, but it did and it does. And so, you know, like I say, there's nothing like success. I, and I know it was important for me, part of tracking it is part of that, and this isn't a large part, but part of that's accountability. Like, you can hide behind your office hours too. <laughs> like you, you can sit in an office and do nothing. Um, I mean, that, that's, I mean, I know that's the fear. If they're at home, then they must not be doing anything. Well, you can be in your office and doing nothing too. So, I mean, part of it is, man, okay, let's just make sure that I'm, I am out there doing things. I mean, that was part of the journey that I was taking to see the, the macro. Uh, I think it's, a, it's probably a good place to insert when the COVID-19 happened, um, we made the decision, obviously we weren't meeting, that I would be in the office more often because at, we made the decision early on. I mean, early on, we thought this is going eight to 12 weeks. We planned for it. 
Like, like we're, we're not, this is going to be a few weeks. And so we needed to figure out how do we stay glued together as a church. And one way we could do that is to have a centralized place where people knew that if they came and they get dropped off their giving, there would be somebody. So that's where we established more strict office hours. And I actually made an effort, like my effort was to be here because I couldn't go visit anybody. It wasn't like, I mean, that was all taboo now. So like, and, and unsafe. So, I mean, it was actually a reversal. And, and because of the relationship the elders and I have, I mean, we joked about it. Like we literally just made all these decisions and now <laughs> I'm going back into office hours, <laughs> but it was very helpful. And I had a lot, a lot of people stopped in, you know, they would just maybe stand at a distance and we talk and that was actually, it provided an anchor and, and that was important. So I think it's also important to remember, and I think Terry just said it was like, you gotta be able to flex on this too. This isn't, the, this webinar, what the goal wasn't to say, we're in a mobile world, go out because being in the office is the old way. I, I think you have to know your community, know your church. And so that's, you know, we, we had to experience that. And literally today, because now I'm able to start moving out a little bit more, like today I spent some time in the community, um, a little bit more because we got some things opening up a little bit and I'm like, I can't keep these strict office hours. Like we're back to the, we have listed these office hours, but I can't, if I'm going to start doing this and I can't do this. So can we change the office hours? Um, and during COVID I have been the secretary too, because our secretary retired and part of our decision to have a, a middle range financial, um, our, um, make a, a decision, we didn't know what our finances would look like. So let's make this, some decisions early on. We froze that position because we were, we were, we had all of our candidates. We were ready. The elders were ready to get down to where they were going to interview. And we suspended that position. And so I took on the role of the secretary. We had outsourced our financing, our bookkeeping. So uh, that was helpful. But so I took on another role in all of this. And so we just now reopened that position and uh, our secretary will be the one who is, um, who is going to be the steady force in the church building. Uh, there is a question, Tim, are you okay if we grab that one? Because someone asked, yeah, a question I wanna, about what do you do yeah, about one that? of them is more of a, yeah, a statement, but I do think Ed kind of picked up where Terry was going to go, which is you've got to work this for what's right with your yeah. church. It's not like yeah. never be in the office, yeah. uh, but you've got to work what's right for your church, but it is good to have healthy handlebars to have perspective on what you are doing that you can move from. If you're, if you're in the office, you know, 39 out of 40 hours a week, you know, we're not saying go to one hour a week. We're saying maybe you should go five hours a week. Uh, yeah. And, but it's gotta be with a purpose. It's not just getting out of the office for no reason. Yeah. It's get out of the office for a purpose. And so I think Ed hit that. I'm going to hit Arthur's here in just a second. And, and, and Jason, I don't know what you, if you want to chime in on that as well. But first, I want to say, if you've got a question, go ahead and type that in right now. I did want to ask earlier, so I thought I'd ask it now in the chat uh, button right now. Jason talked about discovering that he wrote his sermons somewhere better than in the office, which I discovered that as well when I was in located ministry. And so I'm curious in the chat box, if you're a preacher on the call tonight, if you have discovered a place other than the church office that you write your sermons at better, go ahead and hit that in the chat. I got to open up the chat box right here. I'm curious if anybody else says, I know people that, that write their sermons every week, church planters that write their sermons at Starbucks every week, which that would drive me bananas to have that much going on while I'm trying to think. But other people, uh, they, they, get, they find a certain place. But I found out that I write when I'm standing up. I type better and write better when I'm standing up. And so I have to find a place where I can spread all my stuff out standing up and type. So I'm curious uh, for people on our call to that, some, some of their at home, home office, anybody, anybody other than, uh, wait, so we've got a Starbucks right there. That's great. I was gonna say anybody other than home office or church office, anybody else discover kind of by accident sometimes that you write your sermons better in a different location. Um, so, um, so the question that Arthur Glover uh, asks is why do we use the term post and world? And that's, I don't know if there's an official timeline that that became true, but it's, it's just the notion that our country was founded on Christian principles, regardless of what some people might try and paint the history of all that now 
after the fact, but uh, we were a Judeo-Christian uh, culture here in the United States, but that in the last, in our adult lifetimes, that has changed to be a non-Christian, even almost we're verging on it, I would say anti-Christian culture. Um, but the post-Christian would just be where the, the Christian values and the Christian perspective are not the predominant prevailing perspective. And by that, I would say that, you know, when, when we were growing, when I was, this is going to show our age, we're growing up, uh, I was a, sc a high school teacher years ago before I got into ministry. And in a public school, we, um, we did, we were, it was just kind of unwritten that you didn't give a whole lot of homework on Wednesday nights. Because most of the kids went to youth group to, at their church on Wednesday nights around the community. And so there was this kind of unwritten partnership between the churches and the schools that we didn't overload the kids with homework on Wednesday nights. Those days are long gone. I mean, now we've got all of our sports on Sunday mornings and, uh, and we could list all the reasons why now our culture is the predominant voice before the church. Uh, even, and even the blue laws and things that didn't used to open. I mean, it's so it is so out of the norm for Chick-fil-A to say, we're not going to open on Sundays. Uh, it's so peculiar for that. And uh, so, um, so the, that post-Christian is just saying that we're not the prevailing, uh, if you went to ICOM a few years ago when it came to Richmond, it was kind of the theme, it was called the away team, that since our founding, the church has always been the home team and enjoyed the cheers of the crowd and enjoyed the home field advantage in our communities. Uh, but but we are now the away team in our homeland, and we do not enjoy the benefits of all the the uh, politicians' thoughts about who's who should be taken care of first. We are not getting all the immediate cheers of the people in our community. Uh, we are the away team, and so I think that's a good picture of why we might be called a post-Christian world. There are still Christians in our world, no doubt, and the church is still alive and well in our world. But it's a more missionary world than a, a, um, a world where the church has the place automatically just because it exists. Now it has a place because it's making a difference in its community and only if it's making a legitimate difference in its community. Um, so, so, all right, so someone wrote, yeah, that, that they write at night when some people are night owls, you know, and write mm -hmm. 10, to, 10 to midnight. It's hard yeah. to be in the office 10 to midnight or unless you're going to uh, be gone from home a lot or wear your pajamas at the office, one or the other. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a good perspective is that uh, that's, a, that's a significant part of the, the minister's week is how many hours he invests in the sermon. And so to say, you got to be in the office for that. Um, you're you're going to get interrupted if you've got any kind of multiple staff of any kind or people dropping in or whatever. Well, we've just got a, a few more minutes. Are there any other questions that you'd like to chime in on? I would like to say that I appreciated Jason's comment about using the relationship for Waypoint. Uh, Waypoint exists to come alongside churches and leaders to help them get on mission and stay on mission. And this is one of the areas that we would love to serve you and your church is in the area of um, of elder dynamics with the church and the church staff. And, uh, and it's not that we have some kind of opinion on this is the way you need to do eldership at your church, but that we can provide perspective because we get to see different churches every week and we get to interact with elderships. And, and we've got a couple of programs to help coach elderships because by and large, a lot of elders been at their church for a long time. That's why they're elders at that church. And they don't have the benefit of seeing that even an hour away or a half hour away or four hours away in our region, here's some options to think about, about the way you do your elders meetings or your elders retreats or your polity documents and things like that, that Waypoint would love to come alongside you and your church, to help you think about a broader set of options to make your elder team in collaboration, in concert with your staff team, the most effective that it can be. So we'd love to do that if you'd like to contact us about that. Well, uh, just a couple other things I'd like to highlight. I want to thank you again for being part of our webinar tonight and our panelists. What a great story. I think just to say, let's talk about this. And uh, it didn't get uh, you know separated into their corners uh, like two boxers ready to come out swinging, but it was let's get together and let's just have a conversation about how, how can we be the best that we can be. And uh, so I think that's one of the biggest lessons from tonight's conversation, whether it's this topic or some other, but this topic is critical. Uh, of 
understanding that I love that line. I don't remember exactly where it is, but that's a tweetable quote about we've got to go make ministry happen and not wait for it to come to us. Uh, we don't live in that world anymore. Uh, and so that's, that's a great perspective. That's a takeaway for all of us. Let me hit just a couple of things over here to let you know. Of course, we always want to thank uh, Mid Atlantic Christian University, our ministry partner. Uh, but here's our next two webinars that we have coming up in the, the next couple of months. They're, they're related to each other. One is new realities for youth ministry. And so we've got a panelist, a panel of uh, youth ministers in our region from th the three states here, uh, different sized churches and talking about after post COVID, here's some of the new realities, some things that uh, we're going to have to start doing that we weren't doing, maybe some things, the new reality of things we're no longer going to do. And I think that's going to be a real healthy conversation here this summer, thinking about ministry, youth ministry in the fall and beyond. And then, so that's July 20th. And then the following month, August 10th, we've got a panel of three children's ministry leaders, uh, three different sized churches, three different states, same conversation is now that we're post COVID here, how here's how children's ministry is going to need to be different moving forward in the way we program, in the way we recruit, in the way we clean uh, all different kind of ways. Uh, and so those are going to be two great conversations and you may not be the person in your church that those two webinars are best designed for, but you know who in your church is. And so uh, if you would direct uh, the people at your church to, potentially uh, register for one of those two webinars, uh, it may really help them have a broader perspective on how they can really, uh, this is the case for the whole church at large, is this, this, this disruption over the last three months, I was just having this conversation this afternoon driving home from a funeral, is this disruption could be the best thing that's ever happened to the church if we allow it to be. And so that could be true for youth ministry, children's ministry, is we could be better than ever if we're asking and answering the right questions. So I hope, I hope that you'll invite the right people at your church to join these webinars uh, in, in that way. Let me hit stop share. All right, well, again, thank you for joining us tonight. And I really thank our panelists for telling their story and the example that they're given about uh, an elder team and the staff working together to be the best church possible. So guys, thanks for your time. And uh, those that have been with us tonight, thanks for uh, your, uh, uh, your time tonight, because that means by your presence, you're trying to be the best you can be at your church as well. So we'd love to partner with you uh, in that way, any way we can. So please contact us as we need, as you need assistance, we're here to help. So have a great evening and we hope to see you on a future webinar soon.